is there and connecting to audio. Why is it connecting to my audio? You can't, yeah. Okay. Okay, let me go downstairs. That's that's where you're gonna be. That's this you. this thing coming into the Yeah, that's you. So you have to move it walk in, sit over there. Oh I see. Oh, yeah. Can you move it? Well I suppose it's okay. No, it doesn't Are well, you happy with the picture? Yeah, yeah. I'm fairly okay with it. Hmm. Just to continue. I want to I'm gonna come in here like this and then close the door behind. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So who's going to give you the cue to come in? Sorry. Who's going to give you the signal to come in? Or let me talk well, to she you. Can, uh, uh, right. Because no. we have four minutes to go. Let me just ask Nick. Okay, Richard Every. Ah. Lisa Todd, okay. Ah, our, we're growing, eh? numbers are. Uh, yeah. How many people? Two, four, five. There's a Lisa Todd, there's a Sharon Crampton, there's a Richard Avery, there's a Deborah. I don't know if Deborah. Richard Avery and Lisa Todd is Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we like Paul. Paul. You have to let him. Starting? Yeah, starting. Good morning, everyone. I greet you with my Corona hat, which reminds me of 80 years ago when I was born. I can't remember that. I was born in the Second World War, and we wore helmets at that time, gas helmets. And I remember that well as a kid. So I'm now, 80 years later, I'm wearing a helmet again. Welcome. We've asked you to attend one of our mission statements here, our wonderful way of displaying what we do and who we are and that sort of thing. And, and what, what we are about, what I'm about to tell you is about the art that surrounds this whole museum. This museum is a museum of art of incredible masterpieces that you see all around us here. And basically the understanding of that art. Now it has the most important elements of art are that it has to be beautiful. And that's the most accessible way of looking at art is the beauty of it. And as soon as you've got into the thing and you really start loving it, you say, who made this? What's this wonderful thing here? I'm, 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 who, who did this? And our idea is to tell you a little bit about that because art becomes so much more amazing and wonderful and understandable the more you know what created it, who created it, what circumstances created it, and how it's put together and what role it plays in that society. 
So what we are doing, how we're starting uh, our, our talk here, it's called the Paul Talk, actually we don't want to lecture you, is to tell you a little bit about the origins. And so we've named this first one the Nguni origins. Because the Nguni people are the ones that surround us here. It's the majority of the Bantu population in South Africa, but it's actually a very late comer onto, onto the scene. So I thought it might be interesting to first of all, look at some of the days gone by and see just where it came from. So I'm going to sit down. We do know from excavations and DNA tests and all sorts of new things that are on the market now that the Bantu people arrived here at least 2,000, 2,500 years ago. They came from Central Africa uh, and migrated down, firstly in slow waves and then a little faster later on, and settled along the coast. Those were the original Bantu settlers. Normally within about eight kilometers of the coast, and they were farmers. They had a little bit of livestock, they were planting things, and many of them were fishing. And that was the early kind of background to that. Now South Africa goes back much, much further than that because when they came here, there were people here already. They were the most ancient people here already. People that are still there today and whose blood, because as they came down, obviously they intermarried and they, they became part of the greater family of people down here. And so they carried that very same DNA of that period through to today. And the one interesting thing about most of our people down here is that they are basically the families always relate to the parents and to the, to the father. And so whatever the, the structure of the family is, it's going to be the father and his brothers and his, his children. And so the women marry, marry out of the house and the men continue the whole story. So the women in that, in, in that fact, in that marriage, are in fact the most important things because they are the ones that deal with the children. They are the ones that transfer the knowledge and the culture to the next generation. And even today, one can still see that why like, Gogo is so important because she is the one who actually brings up the children and who actually begins the culture. So a lot of what we see here is an absorption of the culture that were brought down from the north, like iron smelting and, and, and uh, the farming even, uh, while, and brought it together into a new kind of society. But basically what one often sees is how powerful that old Khoisan influence still is in what people did. So we go through various stages in these settlements are there which go from, which have now been identified by archeologists as beginning about in the, in the Durban region about a thousand years ago, or, or this is 1,500 years old, sorry, uh, and, and older than that. And these are, they are ceramic potteries. This is pottery. And very, very interesting about it is that it's pottery for people who are not on the move. It is pottery for people who actually are staying somewhere and developing their skills and their crafts and starting to identify themselves with certain patterns. This goes on for about a thousand years and in stages of different stages in this, in our area. But because after that, after living on the coast, people start, new groups arrive and they start to move up the river valleys. And they start to basically new cultural villages in the river valleys of KZN. This is amazing because they are now become villages that actually have specialist trades, that actually have that actually rely on their position, on their land position, 
for their cultivation of their crops. And they basically become proper farmers, but also smelters of iron. Uh, and basically at that stage already, we start that they are trading with people who might come from the coast. Then, about a thousand five hundred years ago, like uh, then, it changes, and we start to get people. We start to get what they call the Blackburn pottery. The Blackburn pottery is a less, much less sophisticated kind of pottery that actually comes from a different group altogether. And we believe that this is the arrival of the Nguni people who come into the uh, who come into the. And they are different people. They are people that have migrated with herds of cattle, probably came in from the west, and they are people on the move. They are people on the move who then settle here. So a lot of their cultural influences are actually dependent on being light, being able to transport things, and being able to move quickly. And the influence that we see around us here is mostly from that period. So then if I go back and we say, where did those original people come from? The original Bantus that settled on the coast. And we still find remnants of those that did not intermarry right up in the north amongst the Venda and so forth and into Zimbabwe. And you will find that their pots are not very different to the pots that we found here a thousand years ago. The interesting thing about those pots, what they were really for home keepers. They were for people who live there and work there and have various organized ways of eating and, f and feeding and so forth. So that the pots basically are round bottomed and fit into each other. It was only much later when the when the black pot and be the black uh, uh, the Nguni people start arriving that we start getting flat pots. But even there, the memory of the pots that are left behind and pots still have a very very small basis, flat piece at the bottom now, and they sit, they rest on the most important thing, that Nguni thing, is the Inkata. The Inkata is the grass ring that holds up your pot. And in the Zulu tradition, it's also the grass ring that actually eventually identifies with the whole nation. Because the king sits on one of these, a powerful king sits on one of these, women wear them when they go out to take the food around. And the men wear a similar thing in the old days, which was an inkata to symbolize their being traditional Zulus. So that's all very interesting. Now, what were this, what were the main, what was the main structure of the Zulus, the, this, in, this new society that was coming in? And because they were warriors. Basically, all herders in the world ended up coming in, taking over areas, and becoming the big bosses in that area. Wherever you look in the world, that's how they begin. Very often, like in Mongolia and China, they, they are the ones that absorb the, the local culture and then become static. And the same thing happened here. So the Ngunis came in with all their cattle, easily defeated whatever resistance there might have been uh, because they were warriors. They had to keep their cattle safe from rustlers. They had to keep their cattle safe from the lions and, and from nature and everything that was over there. And that was all, so that's all that was really in their power to do. So they had the easiest home to live in because it was just constructed out of a couple of, of poles. You could use short timber, long timber, that, and they invented the basket work 
really, because they were people of the cross. So the, the most important thing, there are, there are, there are three, two things that are very, very important in the traditional life of the Zulu or of the Nguni. First thing is grass, because grass keeps you alive. Because the cattle, if your cattle are there, everything revolves around the cattle. The cattle don't actually belong to you, they belong to the ancestors. So you are just there to look after them. And everything that you do, everything comes down to grass. This is a, a filter sack for making beer. Always beautifully done, always very, very, very fine work and that sort of thing, because that is the way how you respect things. Let me just tell you about what laws these people brought in. When these Nguni people arrived here and absorbed the local people, eventually uh, they created a kind of foundation that might have well existed in all wise people of the past, which is that there must be some basic rules that actually decide on how we live together. Because we are human beings, we have to structure ourselves in some way or other. And they came up with three regulations or three attempts. The first one would be, look, we need continuity. We're only here, we're here in this life because the ancestors put us here and we're here to carry on. Otherwise all the work the ancestors have done and all my genes have done, all my DNA has done ever since it was a fish. All of that is wasted. We are here now and our main duty is to carry on. So this, in a way, when you're looking at that kind of idea about carrying on, it means you don't own anything. You don't have to basically grab things, you, you, you're just, you're basically here to produce children, look after the place and go. So there we are. Then if that's the rule number one that they decided to have, number two is we have to do it together. We have to do it together. And in order to be together, we have to share. So the second rule that they, that they made is order because in order to share you've got to know the rules of sharing and so this is basically what it is about so you have sharing order now if you take those things into into the into the political scene or the art scene you will see that order uh, in the political scene, you see that land distribution and the use of land and the ownership of land is very easily resolved when you look at continuity. And in art, you actually see the most important thing in art, as far as our people were concerned, the Nguni people were concerned, is orderliness. In the society, it's orderliness. In the structure, of what you do, it's orderliness. So that was the most important thing. And it ends up in art being about geometry, being about wonderful patterns, about everything is geometric. When it comes to the third and probably the most important one point of all, it's about respect. So the third one, is respect. Now, if you respect something, you have a different attitude to that, or her, or him, or whatever it is, than if you own it. So none of these things, because traditionally you don't own anything. So when you make, this is the milk pail, traditional Nguni milk pail. When you make a milk pail, you need to go to a tree. And you need to take that out of that tree. And it has to be a specific kind of tree. So then you basically have to carve something 
that the tree wants to give you. So you've got to show respect for the tree. You've got to show immense respect for the cattle that belong to the ancestors. And you're lucky you're, you're a Bantu because it, it means Bantus can actually drink milk. One of the reasons for them being able to come down Africa is that they actually were lactose, whatever it is. And one of the other reasons is that they, they, uh, they also were, the, the cattle were, were safe of the tsetse flies. So with those two advantages in malaria, with those two advantages, they managed to come down the infantry, the, the, the lower section. So to come back to this and look, the beauty of this is derived from the way I milk. I've got to hook this between my legs, milk the cow. It's only the men, the men own the cows. The men still, like in the old Nguni tradition, they still look after the cows. They're responsible for the cows. They milk the cows. So look at this beautiful thing. Everyone is different because there was obviously something in the tree, some branches coming out here, which gave me the idea that, oh, that would make a very nice uh, hold of, of, uh, of the pot. Then you need to stop the slipping out of your hands. So you need to put something on the side there. And that becomes the name of the clan. This is the clan, a, a, a royal clan, way up in Zululand over here, and you'll see that others have different signages altogether. So if anybody tells you people, people didn't have writing in those days, it, it, it is just because we've all, many of us come from the West and we've analyzed and we've studied and we know what writing is. Writing is what they do in England. Uh, so basically, this is the milk pail. And then when, it, when you finish milking, it comes on top, it stays with the cattle stays with the cattle who are in the central kraal and is put on top of the poles that form the fence of it. Now, while we're talking about that, the settlement village, while all the other villages basically were stretched out or individual homesteads, the Nguni village really retains that quality of being way out in the country. And you have a central cattle enclosure, which is basically reinforced with great big poles that link over each other and can be very, very beautiful. And that's where the cattle are. The cattle are really, and they are your, your life. That's where the grass is so important because if the cattle have grass, you're alive, you get milk. And so you carry on and, and you get, skins to clothe yourself with. You get all sorts of things from those cattle. And that area is the area of the men. And old women who have actually had children and that sort of thing and are in retirement, they are allowed to go in under certain circumstances. It's also the place where you store the grain. Big deep pits where, the store, where grain is storied for a, for a bad day. It's also the pit, the, the area where the head of the household might well be buried eventually. So this great big circular thing in the middle, which you really I call the, it's the church or the temple or the, or the, the, the mosque of the, of the homestead, is surrounded by a gallery an open area where people interact with what's going on inside there and then surrounded around the outside by the various huts. And they also, and it's all very, very orderly, right in the middle would be the big house. That is probably where these days where Gogo lives, the old mother. Then next to on, on the right hand side would be the lineage of that home, which is the first wife. 
And then if he has another wife, and it wasn't very common to have too many wives, but two was about the maximum, although sort of bigger thinking people might have more than that. But basically, that was how your family structure was. Then each, the, the grandmother would look under little tiny children. As kids, uh, kids got older, they looked after the next level of child. And so it went on until uh, and until they moved into their own little little hut and grew up. So it was basically the, 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 the homestead, the big boss in the middle, and then huts around the outside. Kitchens were kept one row away. So as, as was, was any other further family that might arrive at the thing. The whole thing outside is again closed by a big fence to stop the wild animals rushing into there. So it was a very defensive structure. And if you look at what happens in wars and that sort of thing, you look at the Boers, uh, the, basically it was the same thing. When the Boers had their violent fights with the, with, the, uh, with the local Bantu people, they also made a big circle and defended it from within that circle. So basically it seems to be a military kind of thing, uh, a way of, of keeping out the bad guys. When, when you start having a lot of people, the interesting thing amongst the Ngunis was like to have a royal, uh, a royal place, you'd find that the whole thing just grows into enormous sizes, like kilometers, eight kilometers or you know, in, in, in length or, you know, a thousand meters or 1,200 meters in distance from one end to the other. But again, we arranged in the same way we arrived right at the top would be the head, which would now be the king and all his helpers and that sort of thing. And then slowly filtering down to people as they become less and less important. So now I want to go back a little bit, talk about grass. So the grass is just incredibly important. So you sleep on it. And this is a traditional grass mat. Try and make it very beautiful. And you weave it. It's really the only weaving that we have in South Africa. And these get rolled away. The house is normally beautifully clean. Everything is swept and, 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 and it's all well organized. And so every morning you roll up your sleeping mat and you put it up in a frame like this that actually celebrates again your clan. Because by now people have developed patterns and shapes that relate directly to that clan, never to yourself, always to the clan. You yourself, that would be, uh, that order wouldn't allow that. That you would actually say, hey, this is, this is me. No, no, no. You'd say, hey, this is us. So we come back to this. And so this is us. Us is what brings us Ubuntu eventually. Because if you talk about us, then what you're doing, you are saying, you know what? I have a job from God. I'm very good at doing this. I have a job from God too. I'm very good at helping him. And so you put your people together in, in the basis of what they are really, what their skills are, what their excellence is. So you, that's why you work. That's why you, you do it, because you help each other. And this is what is missing in our society. The Ubuntu is gone. Everybody is there for themselves. But let's look further. Let's look at what happened to the, when as things developed, the peace of, I must just clear something. Is it five minutes left or? Five minutes left. Five minutes, minutes left. So out of all this, and all this thing you hear, and that we will talk about in the future, is eventually when these 
terrible colonizers and terrible apartheiders and, and, and I'm better than you people and all those people arrive. One has to deal with that. How do you deal with that? You deal with that in terms of knowing who you are, knowing what your values are, knowing what it is, and then become a cultural animal. An animal that actually says, but I'll use that. Oh, I can learn something from here. I can do this, I can do that. As long as I remember, as long as my strength is there, I can absorb all these amazing things to make me into more, to make my culture even richer. And so what you see here is basically what happened. All this art comes from the period when the Ngunis were really, after lots of wars and all sorts of things happened, uh, during which time you didn't really bother about how pretty this thing was. You just had to do this or had to do that or kill that one. Uh, at that period, you start trying to do things like then Mpande arrives in about the 1870s. Mpande, King Mpande, a very important king. And he, he was a brilliant politician. So he gave away half of the country and that sort of thing, but at least he said, but, you know, people feel good about who you are. Look, do this and do that and that sort of thing. So the real culture that we represent in this museum actually rises out of peace, a peaceful settlement when people could start to relax and actually not be scared of being chased away from here or chased away to there but actually a period of settlement where they could again spend their time making beautiful things. So the eating mat, look at that, beautifully done. And they start making incredible artworks here. Look at, look at that again. So basically, I'm told I have to wind up. So please, we are open for questions now, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I was going to tell you a lot more, but we've run out of time. Uh, please look in the future uh, and, and look at our, our film that we made last week, and, and, and you'll get much more of an insight. But I hope that you're a little bit aware of who the Ngunis are and how they relate to the other Bantu people. Uh, in the past. Thank you. Uh, now we have question time. Yes. So much. It's so wonderful to hear you. I'm in, in Windsor in England. I'm a great fan of Zulu art. I grew up in Durban. It's really fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to say thank you. Can you hear? Yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit deaf. Um, so. oh, I just wanted to say thank you. I, I'm in Windsor in the UK and I grew up in Durban and I'm, a, I'm an artist and I collect lots of Zulu artifacts and beadwork and wire bowls. So, and it was just lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It, it, it's, it's that. You see, our problem is that when you, my grandmother, my mother, knew everybody in her family uh, was an uncle or an aunt. We tried to work out who links to whom, but you know, that was actually impossible because she was so involved in it, she was so in depth with, there was, that's just my family, that we couldn't actually work out a structure. And the same thing happens here, is that most people out there, they live in that world. They, they, do, they see this every time, it's around them all the time. So, and in fact, half of what is published now and publicized now and celebrated now all tells people that, look, that was a bad time. You, know, you must go away from there. You must do pictures of people having sex or something or other, then you will get somewhere. Uh, so basically, we are saying to people, no, this was an incredible inheritance. Look, and all that was done under this incredible pressure and attempt 
to make you into slaves. But you were not slaves. You handled the whole thing and you came out with incredible music, incredible art. Feel good about it, learn more about it, enjoy it. So that's basically our big job is to make black <coughs> people in South Africa take ownership of this art and buy buy the art because it's still being produced. Still, people are still making this, or well, they still know how to make it. But the only people who buy them are people from all over the world. And we want to tell them that, look, people all over the world want this stuff. Don't you want to know more about it? Don't you want to be also be part of that pride? So basically, that's a long answer, but it, it gave me an opportunity to talk about that. Thank you. Any other questions? No, very, very silent. So let me tell you then, uh, let me go on a little bit. In order to achieve that, we are, well, first of all, our issue here is that in South Africa, we are the only museum that celebrates this as an art gallery. All our installations throughout the museum are art installations. Because we first of all want to flood you with these amazing impressions. Artistic, wonderful, colorful, amazing impressions. If you want to know more, we call ourselves a feel-good museum. So come inside here, come in like this, and by the time you leave, feel good. You feel good about the people who made this. You feel good about you because you suddenly have learned something else. You've learned to respect people that you were told were, you know, Iron Age people, Stone Age people, or whatever, whatever it was. This is just the amazing stuff that surrounds us. So and let me just show you a little bit more about these two. In terms of the Ngunis, they varied widely and the influences came from all over the place. So this, this particular exhibition here deals with people in the Drakensberg no, who were married, we wear this what we call Isikoti, which is a kind of a cape that you wear for the first two years after you've entered marriage. After you've had a child, because in that male linkage system, you will only be really the deal of you being a wife will only go through when you've had a child. After that, you can stay, but you probably might well move back to your family because you're not compatible. Uh, Andrea has a, a, a question for you. Uh, he says, she says, hello, Paul, can you suggest a living village where one can interact? Uh, a living village. Well, we, we have a question here about a living village somewhere. Can you say? Uh, we don't have that sort of thing. We well, Basically, because the art has never been owned by the people themselves, there also is very little of that. If, if you go to the Shawe area and uh, you go to, you stay at the George Hotel or that sort of thing, there are people there who can take you out to homesteads and villages that are still very, con very uh, conservative. So, and you can get their stories, but there's, there's nothing like a living village or like an open air museum as you get overseas. There are these sort of, uh, commercialized settlement uh, uh, occasions that we used to have that very much really funk the whole thing into uh, we think we don't think it's really an honest way of selling it's just a, a, a wild way of trying to get into the market uh, and it celebrates mostly the zoo as a warrior and not so much in terms of those philosophies and those issues that I was talking about which are the issues of peace, you know, because I think in the, 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 
with this incredible split between on the one side the culture of the home and on the two side the management of the home which is which is the male you get the warrior influence together with the cultural influence and the warrior influence revolves around fighting the wars and this is the pattern of the royal family Here, because when you eat meat and when you've slaughtered an animal, which is a sacrifice, this is the meat platter. You share your food. And you can see it has that same image, image of the shield. It's a man's thing. So it looks like a shield. And it has those royal designs on it that allocate it to the man's side of it. But you also see that it's black underneath. Because black is the color of respect. And this shows that after you've eaten, it's hung up on the wall of your home, and it shows, says, thank you for the cow of the ancestors. We've sacrificed her for a big celebration or a major event. But this is the men's side. You know, the, like in, in modern society, they would never be seen. Men, men deal with the leather. Men deal, they, they don't touch grass. They don't touch a lot of things that like farming and digging in the ground and that sort of thing. Men don't do that kind of thing. They are strong things. You see a, a, a similar sort of thing is that one of my neighbors here, I see that his great art is that he's really totally, totally devoted to is cleaning his car. Every weekend, he, he admires the stitching in his car, he vacuums it, he does all the things that he's not allowed to do at home. So, but, you know, to ask him to help in the kitchen would be a real, that was a bit of a demand. So that's the traditional layer on the whole world, and basically the same thing happened in this society. Just one last, one last, point that I, I want to want to mention is that see this poor man that's me Fancy is a private museum can you see it and we've been put together by a foundation and this is the little man so we are saying if you have any way of raising funds for us because we don't appeal to the governments of this world because they want they don't want to forget the horror of apartheid the horror of separate development the horror of, of those sort of things they don't want to see that some people actually created amazing things and dealt with it in completely different ways and there were maybe like i you know but in those years when i was telling you about when i was wearing the gas mask I enjoyed those years. It was fantastic when those Americans came and bulldozed the houses down. What a life we had for those first five years of my existence. So, you know, look at that whole thing in the light of survival. Survival doesn't have to be a negative thing. So if you can make donations to us, to this poor guy here, he's <coughs> Or if you know anywhere you might do, please do that for us. And thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well done, well done. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, they gone? Yeah, no. Okay. Was that yours? High five. Sorry? There you go. Mm -hmm.